let's adjust that volume. Test, test, test. Hello everyone. Gonna pull that down. Move that. Go to here. Hello, hello. All right. Twitch is telling me my bitrate is really poor. Um, so let's see how we go. Can you audio levels fine? As long as the audio is audio is uh, clear. Oh man, probably got big lag. Let's see if we can pop this one up here. Ugh, frame rate. Can I do anything? Nope. Uh, well, there we go. Tell you what, let me just. Um, that's not what I want. Come on, come on. Nope, all right. Also, I don't want that. All right. So, who we got? 10 people. Roll up, roll up. Come to get your good homological algebra. I probably need to move over there a bit, otherwise I'll run off the page. Maybe a bit more. Oh, it's yeah, that's better. <clears throat> yeah, I'm in the in the Discord, I just wanted to get that GIF off the off the screen. Let me just throw in some extra dummy space. Okay. Har. Well, bit rate is no longer red. It's creeping along. Coding overloaded. Ooh. What? Consider turning down the quality again. Ooh, I ain't doing that. All right. We just press on. So, <clears throat> where do we end up? Our last, last lecture. So let me just. Right, we did a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, see if we can find the bit where we started. All right. All right keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right. This is where we started. We started with a short exact sequence of cochain complexes, namely this. So i is injective in each dimension and pi is subjective. And the image of i is a kernel of pi. So that's that's fine. When we apply cohomology, we lose um, some of that exactness properties, and all we get is that um, <clears throat> it's exact only in the middle again. All right, so now we have for hn, nth cohomology module, we could put a zero on the left here and a zero on the right here, but we don't have exactness as a short exact sequence. We just have its exact in the middle, which is the same thing as that the, uh, the image of i, hn i is the kernel of hn pi. So that's some information, but not that much, relatively speaking. Okay, so then we did a whole bunch of stuff. Let me just zoom out. Um, we introduced things like, don't do that. Uh, we introduced things like the shift uh, somewhere. Well, we introduced the mapping cone. So here's the definition of the mapping cone. So we stuck um, a bunch of um, 
mismatch degree modules together and define this new differential D. Um, and we also introduce the mapping of the, the shift functor. So we, in particular, we were looking at the shift which moves all the modules down by one, at least to start with. And there were some funny signs that we had to throw in just for um, make all the bits and pieces join up. And we started seeing how these things all live together. So um, I'm not going to recap all of this. We had some handy lemma that how do we prove a quotient module? Um, a map of quotient modules is an isomorphism. This uh, this lemma here. So this is uh, makes things easier to check. And all right, so let's keep going. Oh, we define this new map. Um, <clears throat> sort of curly D N so we're gonna see this in a bit but I'll, I'll recap when we get to it and we started getting some exactness properties so here we go this is where we ended up I believe so what happens is this curly D N starts connecting the connecting homomorphism it starts connecting the cohomology modules in different dimensions. So it connects um, the cohomology of C in degree N with the cohomology of A in one degree higher. And now um, we're exact. So you grab uh, contrast. We get exactness not just at B, which we observed right at the start of all this, but now we get exactness at C as well at least in cohomology and so all this is true for arbitrary uh, dimensions so it means we get exactness here hn plus one c and that keeps going and exactness here and so what we're missing is exactness at at a so here and here, it doesn't matter, you just use arbitrary n. And if it was exact at all these a positions, then you would have a long exact sequence. All right, so the, the, um, the goal was we would like to show exactness at hn plus one a. So we need to compare the image of this partial dn, this curly dn, and uh, yeah, so the image of that, image of curly dn, that's here, and also the kernel of hn plus one i here. So they should be equal to get exactness. And the, the tool we've been using to show exactness uh, in cohomology is getting some short exact sequence of cochain complexes. Wrong option. So what I want is a short exact sequence of cochain complexes where oops, on a white where this shifted A complex is in the middle. Because then the cohomology of this is exactly H. Because it's shifted, it's H n plus 1 A. So I don't, you know, what do I put on either side of it to get a short exact sequence? Um, but we saw as part of the proof on in the previous lecture, we don't actually need the specific uh, cochain complex we started with. If we had something quasi-isomorphic to it, it would still give. So this this one here, I want h uh, n of a twiddle dot to be isomorphic to h n shifted a which is then isomorphic to this so i'm allowed to replace it by something that gives 
isomorphic cohomology as long as it all fits into the sequences appropriately. I don't want something that's like arbitrarily isomorphic to it and it doesn't fit in the well that we've created about all these this data. Okay, so those people who asked for a little recap, uh, do you feel suitably um, uh, warmed up? Because about here is when I started getting a bit um, impressionistic. This is where we'll pick up. Okay. So Chris is happy. JS is happy. Cool. Two out of 17. <clears throat> Any more votes for continuing? I must say to fill the, the dead space. It was so nice to go out to a cafe this morning and do some work. Oh, just go and get a little coffee, sit there and write, lagging behind like a minute. Yeah, that's uh, maybe refresh, uh, Chris. Let's see, maybe I should say that. I should say refresh to catch up. Okay. Let's rock and roll. Uh... I don't know what some of this stuff is down the bottom here. All right, I'll just keep, I'll just push on. That was kind of... Um, blah, 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 blah. All right, that's all a very... Um, I'll just push that off the screen. Okay, so here's a fact. So it takes a C, sends it to zero C, and takes a BC and projects it onto B. Um, this is a short exact sequence. And just to recap, cone N of pi And it's nth differential is given by this matrix. Um, <clears throat> if you want to be super pedantic, we can say the dimensions of the, the db and dc as well. All right, <clears throat> so what this tells us, using our handy lemma, this tells us that this cohomology, uh, n, I've got names for these, uh, J, 2, Q, H, N of Q. Uh, it, this is exact at this middle spot. Uh, but what we want, we don't want this, we want HN shifted A. So we need to show that the cohomology of this cone pi is the same as the cohomology of the shifted A. So let's define a map between them and then we'll show you that's a quasi isomorphism. So 
this takes an A and for technical reasons sends it to minus IA in the first slot All right so IA like I is a map from A to B so so this lives in the right place and um, so this is here is N plus one because the A is shifted and the B is shifted in this uh, this mapping cone So J1 is a quasi-isomorphism. So I'm going to just start the proof and it's going to be in the assignment to actually do the full proof. So we have to take, right, so we, what do we need to do? We have the lemma that says if we want to show a map of quotient modules, like cohomology modules is an isomorphism we have to show that um, we have a, a couple of linear maps which are subjective so we take bc in the mapping cone in degree n and for the lemma sorry to apply the the criterion to show we have an isomorphism of quotient modules we need to take something that is a representative for something in cohomology so this should be equal to zero just to write it out explicitly uh, minus pi n plus 1b plus dc of little c uh, that's not a matrix that's a vector this should be equal to zero zero and what we want we want uh, an A such that um, J1 of A is BC and D of this is equal to zero, which just to remind you is minus D A of A. So that doesn't affect that part of the calculation. So that's the first half. Um, so we see C assignment three for the rest of the proof. So that tells me that H N of J1. So it's important that you actually have specific maps here, Spe uh, like specified maps. Isomorphism of R modules. Right, so I'm going to draw a diagram which kind of fits together all the bits and pieces we know. So, H in B, H in C, and the names of the, the, the linear maps here are important, so I've got to write them all out. So this is from last time. This is HNP2, that was an isomorphism. This is to HNA shifted. This is called HNP1. Now, curly DN is. Um, <coughs> The inverse of HNP2 followed by HNP1. So unwinding it, that makes this little triangle commute. HN shifted B. Ugh. And this is shifted I. That's 
that linear map there. Okay, but now we also have um, HNC maps to HN cone on mapping cone of pi, and we have a map here which was uh, HN J1, and this is an isomorphism. Um, cool. And I should remind you that this map here it takes a C, uh, this is H N J2, where J2 of C is 0 C inside cone pi. Alright, and so this, uh, we're going to define a new map curly dn prime which is well I can throw the inverse of j1 h n j1 in here so that goes this way so it also maps it's almost like curly dn but how do they relate right because a short exact sequence, or sorry, I say a long exact sequence, we need specific maps. And we're given, like, <clears throat> we're working with curly dn, and I've cooked up a new map. Um, so uh, we have, um, from before, image of h n j2 because we proved exactness of the wrong sequence before we have this this is the exactness of the thing at the start of this lecture um, but we want it in terms of one of these curly d's so you can do some trickery here um, what does that tell us? Well, we know J1 is invertible, so like we can, we sort of can throw that in the mix without um, messing things up. So, um, oh yeah, and I should write here, we have one more map. This map up here is HNQ. Right, so HNQ is the same as H and J one inverse then compose with H N of this shifted I. So these that triangle commutes, that triangle commutes, that triangle commutes. And from this we can work out that H this is like kernel of um, H M plus one I compose H N J one inverse. So you can push that HNJ1 inverse on the other side. Um, oh, where does the J1 inverse go? Oh yeah, so we want um, well, the image of curly D N. And ultimately we want to compare this to the image of curly D, oh, curly dn primed, and then we want to compare it to the image of curly dn with no prime. J1 inverse, J2. Work this is the same thing as the kernel of Hn shifted i which is so that's a kernel this is a kernel of h n plus one i so this is a little calculation you have to do 
I encourage you to check that one. Putting that together, you get H N C goes to this is now curly D N prime. This is the punchline. You can go back and check that other stuff separately. This is the bit you care about. And taking away all the shifts and moving the um, cohomologies as needed, this is exact at the A, the A spot. Which is image of DN prime. Okay, I'll write it up there. Yep. Okay. That's kind of fast and loose, um, but it's just repeatedly using the fact that HNJ1 is an isomorphism. And so its image is everything. And so you're sort of mapping it in. And you're not changing anything and its kernel is trivial so um, it sort of doesn't add anything to the kernel it doesn't take anything away from the image um, <clears throat> so that's a nice little calculation um, yeah you can check that one all right but this is not quite what we want what we want is All right, so it almost, um, we've done all this work and we've got exactness involving the wrong map. So that's maybe mildly disappointing, except we have tools to deal with this. So let's suppose, um, all right, because these are maps induced on quotient modules. So it's not obvious um, that they're different, right? Because everything's in terms of equivalence classes and it may turn out that even though they're defined involving different maps on equivalence classes, they agree. Even though on representatives, they may not. So what happens if we say, can we show they're equal? I mean, <coughs> spoiler, they are equal, but how would we show this? So this is true precisely when let's write out the definition of both of them uh, p2 inverse h and j1 h n oh that's an inverse h n j2 so is are they equal we can rearrange this to get rid of the inverses because the problem is with the inverses present we must be working at the level of cohomology so everything's at the level of equivalence classes But we can rearrange this equation and get hn j1 hn p1 hn j2 is h oops composed p2 but because these are functors we can push the j's and the p's together Oops, and this side is H N J two P two. So now what we want to do is show that a pair of maps induce the same thing on cohomology, which is different from asking that these curly D maps are the same, which are defined in terms of composites involving inverses of maps on cohomology. So how do we prove oh. cast your mind back we had a pair let's say we had a pair of maps and we want to show that they they induce the same map on cohomology Does anyone want to hazard a guess while I wreck my whistle? And 
this one moment. So Chris suggested cochain homotopy, um, and this is, this is exactly what we want to do. Something, 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 their difference is a thing. Yes, uh, DMN. Um, that's that's, that's the, the good way to remember it. <clears throat> they differ by something that gives you zero in when you pass the cohomology. So... Okay, so it's got to be a cochain homotopy from J1, P1, J2, P2. So now we've removed ourselves from the world of cohomology, we're back up at the level of cochain complexes. So this is where we have the freedom to manipulate things uh, more freely. Because it's hard to work at the level of equivalence classes. So what have we got? We can throw away all the cohomology decorations. So we've got cone on I... C, so that's uh, P2, J2, cone on pi, this is shifted A, J1, P1, and that happens to be a quasi-isomorphism, that happens to be a quasi-isomorphism, which is why we can do all the, the tricks with the inverses at the level of cohomology, except now we don't need this, now we just everything's just maps of chain complexes and we can write down matrices representing maps and so on so one thing to note uh, if this diagram commuted would be done but this does not commute you can check that um, going back and looking at the definitions that we wrote down so the next best thing is to say it commutes once we apply cohomology functors, which is why we're going to find a cochain homotopy. So what is the required data? All right, it's a map from cone n of i, and we have to map down a dimension, cone n minus 1, pi uh, okay so what is that let's call these hn's cone i gives us uh, shifted a plus b mapping to shifted b but now everything's down a dimension so this is bn and cn minus one all right so this is for all integers such that uh, <clears throat> let me just go back keep that bit on the screen we have um, okay so when you're looking at the difference of something here it doesn't matter and I wrote it down one way and it turns out there's an extra minus sign at the end um, so that's no biggie you could flip the, the ones and the twos things and you get rid of that minus sign but never mind um, so J2 it's P2 minus J1 P1 has to be equal to so we want to prove this uh, it's the differential of cone pi in degree n minus 1 composed with these HNs is HN plus one composed with the differential for cone i in degree n. <clears throat> okay, um, so these differentials, they're explicit matrices that we can write down. Um, and the left hand side here, we can calculate. And so then the question is, we've got to find, um, and so what H, H's are given by matrices as well. They're matrices where each entry is a linear map 
between the appropriate modules A's, B's and C's. So I've got it in more detail in the notes, I'll just outline it here. Um, in fact, I might even just... Um, no, it's, it's unenlightening. I'll write down the final answer. Uh, it's not plucked out of the air. You can do a calculation and you can see why it has to be this. You keep all the information in, choose nothing arbitrarily, and then uh, you get to a point and you say, well, this has to be equal to this. And if I settle these things to zero, then it's clear what the answer has to be. So it's not unmotivated, but the calculation is just like, is big and um, matrices with terms that are sums of things with lots of subscripts and stuff. So I'm not going to write that down here, but it'll be in the handwritten notes. Um, so the left-hand side, let's calculate J1P1 of something, right? Because, um, so this has to be a map. I should say, what is this? This is going to be as maps from A M plus 1 plus BN to BN plus 1 plus CN. All right, so what I'm looking for is, a, is um, these maps HN such that I have an equality of linear maps of this type given by this identity. So let's calculate J1, P1. Okay, I have to take something in AN plus 1 direct sum BN. Uh, so P1 gives me uh, just A. That's J1 of A. And then J1 of A is minus I N plus 1 of A, 0. And J2, P2 of A, B is... Uh, J to pi n b, which is zero pi n b, and so their difference. So the left hand side is equal to. Well, I throw in an a b there. Um, <coughs> is equal to i n plus one a pi n b. And it's almost the only thing you can sensibly write down because um, what do I have? I have maps i from a to b and pi from b to c and I've got something in a and b and I want something in b and c respectively. So we could just apply i and pi and we get the right thing and the degrees will match up. Um, so that's all right. That's probably not so bad. I mean, as a matrix, I suppose you could write it as like I n plus one pi n like that. Okay. Um, okay, so then we could calculate the right hand side. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's uh, uh, quite icky to calculate. So what I'm going to do is write down an H and show you it works. So it's not an educated guess. It's a bit more than that. So the calculation suggests uh, so H is going to be a matrix. missed an N there. And again, this is kind of one of the few sensible things you can try. Because you don't know anything about the data you've got, and you've got something, an A and a B, and you want to get a B and a C, but now the dimensions are different. And um, in principle, you could throw in some differentials and various maps but it's not clear and so this is the simplest thing you can try and it turns out um, that it's pretty much the only thing that works 
So we can calculate. Uh, so say the calculation. All right, now let's write down. So this uh, equation up here, this this term here, it's dH plus HD. is going to be uh, d pi h plus h composed d i. This is my shorthand. <coughs> uh, and I, I, that's some operator. I throw in an a, b. So everything here is explicit. Like you can just write down these matrices, multiply them out. Um, and so what is this going to be equal to d minus db minus pi I'll leave off all the, the subscripts just to make things easier so then h applied to a b well let's just write it out plus uh, 0 minus 1 0 0 minus d a minus i zero d c and dot 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 first year uh, linear algebra except applying d's and pi's and i's you can't commute them because they're functions uh, this is equal to and you if you're careful with all the subscripts and the dimensions, it's exactly what we needed. It's J1, P1, minus J2, P2, applied to A, B. Okay. Phew. Okay. So that's the thing we can write down. Any questions? So we're on the home stretch. I should type any questions in the box because you see that first. <coughs> Uh, pi and B in last. Uh, yes. Sorry, DMN, that's a... That should be a B, because pi N doesn't apply to... Uh, our space kitter, why do we care from an abstract point of view? Um, the, the mapping cones allow us to remove making arbitrary choices in the definition of the the um, the connecting homomorphism so these curly dn's um, the usual construction of them is roughly oh, uh, well you can pick an element such that blah and then that satisfies something so you can find this other element in this other place and then so define that element to be the representative for the equivalence class which is the image of this cohomology class and then you have to check that everything works <clears throat> like it's well defined and it's a homomorphism and so on uh, if you do it this way um, it allows you to rephrase everything in terms of actual maps of cochain complexes and the only time you do anything um, Yeah, you're not really you, you. You essentially can say, "I'm just going to invert things that already exist, rather than manufacturing linear maps out of thin air." So, if anyone's seen the the usual proof of the snake lemma, um, that gets used to do what we just did, but it's. Um, 
much more conceptually unsatisfying because it's um, all it does is says oh there's a map in this way and we construct it in some complicated fashion uh, and you, you apply it to this other manufactured context out of the actual data that you have which is not really the same um, there's a lot more diagram chasing whereas here we write down some actual linear maps and maps of cochain complexes um, and every every little lemma that we use is kind of a general purpose but also conceptual lemma rather than a here's a magic lemma all right so we're we're on the on the run up okay <clears throat> so what does this show so this shows we we have ah cool yeah yon yon hui li yeah it's when i first saw this uh proof uh i don't know if i said but uh a guy called john rice told it to me and um he came up he came up with it himself um so we're actually going to write a little note to explain the proof and why it's awesome um so we have a cochain homotopy Uh, J1, P1, J2, P2. Um, and so, so unwinding uh, all the arguments back, we get that curly DN is curly DN prime, which tells us that, um, which one was it that we needed to show? Shows us that M DN prime is M DN, which is, and we had exactness. Let me do it the other way around. That which is kernel of H N plus one I. And now the curly, like the curly DN prime, that was just like a technical, um, okay, it's not just technical, but for our purposes, it was just a technical sort of side street, which we got around the fact that we didn't really know how to characterize the image of curly DN. So we defined some other map, which uh, gave us something exact, and that map was actually equal to the original map. So we're all good. So here's the theorem. So if you've never seen a proof that extended for uh, nearly three lectures, you have now. So given a short exact sequence So short exact sequence as we've been, as we've been discussing. We have a long exact sequence. Um, These maps are H N I, H N pi, is that curly D N, H N plus one I, like so, and it just keeps going. Uh, and the curly D N is a specified map.
cool. So, I mean, really the proof has constructed something more, which is at the level of cochain complexes. And that's a story that I can't go into in this course. But the upshot is that you apply, that's a bullet, um, you apply cohomology and you get this long exact sequence. So sometimes this goes by the name of zigzag lemma. For instance, on Wikipedia, um, <clears throat> I like to call it the algebraic Maivia torus because it's basically the, what becomes a Maivia torus sequence, which we're going to um, do next. Um, yeah, but the proof has actually constructed something at the level of cochain complexes. And then once we hit it with cohomology, we get this long exact sequence. And this long exact sequence is basically how we're going to compute everything that we compute in this course, which isn't just some finite dimensional thing where we write down some matrices. We're just going to find uh, a different short exact sequence that fits the situation that we're, we're in. Yeah, so Chris, it's more than a lemma. Oh, we, we had lots of little lemmas. This is, this is honestly a theorem because we've constructed something better. So this statement of the theorem is not the full import of what we've done. I mean, if it feels any better, a guy called uh, No Bao Chao um, got a Fields Medal for proving what's called the fundamental lemma in Langland's theory, in the Langland's program. Like literally, oh, here's a fundamental lemma. Uh, I, I, it seems a bit tricky. I won't prove it now. Fast forward 40 years, a guy proves it and gets a Fields Medal. So. Lemmas are not to be sneezed at. Okay. Right, so I've got to write down an example where this applies. And we're going to actually write down some uh, several examples over the next like half a lecture or so. Um, and uh, the import of this is it allows us to calculate cohomology of like a delta set, for instance, and eventually topological spaces in terms of cohomology of other topological spaces or other delta sets. Um, and you can kind of bootstrap this a little bit and get to a point where it turns out the computation is calculate the cohomology of a single point, um, <clears throat> in which case it's obvious. And then you wind back through all the def all the, all the the linkages that you got from um, examples like this. Okay, I'm going to see. Can I write with this plugged in? Oh, I can. All right, let's see if I can move this power board as far as I can. Yes. All right. I want to run out of battery again. This is a uh, this way. So I should be good for now. Any comments? I'll write down a big example. I'll write an example. I better push on. Keep the comments coming. Um, all right, so here's a corollary. So this is usually like Maya Via Taurus. So as it turns out, uh, um, yeah, just to, okay. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot in this. This is like probably the biggest theorem we'll prove in the course. I had another one that I wanted to do, but um, I'm not sure if we'll get 
um, <clears throat> time to actually do the gory details. Unless I just type it up and hand it out and make that that proof is not examinable, but we will use the theorem. Um, so here's the corollary. This is for delta sets. So let's suppose we have some delta set, sub delta sets. And everything in X comes from is either in U and V. Um, so what this means is that uh, V. So sometimes we start from X, and we take some smaller things inside it, or we might actually. Um, start from u and v and their, and their putative intersection and make x as via a push out. Um, <clears throat> so we get a short exact sequence of cochain complexes. We get a long exact sequence. Of modules. So the general case uh, that we did before, it was for all integers. But now because we know that um, cohomology vanishes for negative integers for delta sets, this means we know we have a zero at the start. Um, so you don't necessarily get this, but we do here. Uh, And H1 and then you go up a dimension and you keep going uh, and then you can oh let's just keep going H1 so on dot 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 and in general And, um, and on it goes. So if um, if x is finite dimensional, this ends with a zero at. Once you get past uh, the dimension of x, uh, yeah, sorry, that's the zeros. Um, cool. Yeah, so this allows us to calculate um, the cohomology of x in terms of the cohomology of u and v and the intersection of V, which is um, good if, for instance, U and V and all their intersection are simpler than um, simpler than X 
or, or conversely, if X is reasonably simple and U and V are reasonably simple and their intersection is more complicated, then that's the thing we can try to calculate. So maybe I mentioned this to one person, but here's a nice exercise. This doesn't use this my via story stuff, but um, you might like to try this because we will be using it. In particular, if you're building a a dev set out of uh, things, and the sort of n simplex is one of the things you're building it out of, then you kind of need to know this. I mean, and this is because like the solid n simplex is like a solid ball, which is topologically, if we're in the topological world, it's contractible. So. Um, <clears throat> But we're going, to get, we're going to get to topology very soon. So we can start talking about things like contractible shortly. All right. I'm going to leave it there. I've got a meeting to run off to. But um, yeah, pop your questions in Discord. And I can, uh, once you've had a good read through everything. And then, yeah, I will. Um, uh, there's a gather town thing now, I think. But I have something I have to go to, so I might try to pop in after that. And otherwise, I'll see you all on Wednesday um, for the lecture and also people in Adelaide actually on campus. So cool. Stay safe. Catch you later.